Hey, welcome to the Algae Talk podcast, the show about algae and all things relevant. Uh, my name is Ivan Pilov, and I'm joined by my friend and co-host and co-worker, Jack Luntz. Welcome. Nice to be um, here. Nice to be here with you too. So for the first episode, we're going to talk about history of algae Correct. and humans. Mm -hmm. We're going to uh, take our time machine, standing over there. And sit in it and go back to those times when people were only discovering algae. Right. And um, I'd like to ask you, Jack, about when was the first time we know or can suggest that people discovered algae? Uh, the earliest records that we actually have um, is mainly from refuse piles, people that, you know, they're, they're trash afterwards because there wasn't you know, the writing uh, mm -hmm. that there was in, you know, the future. So we're going back in our time machine, back to 10,000 BCE, and we're looking at Japan, and this is during the Jomon period, which archaeologists say is between 10,000 to about 300 BCE. And what we're seeing during that period is that there are a hunter-gatherer uh, civilization. And among those things that they were gathering uh, where algae. Correct, right? which is seaweed. And okay. where we know this from is from the archaeological evidence. If we go back 10,000 BCE, so we can say that humans and algae go way back to a very, very um, far period in time. Right, and also some would say that there wouldn't be humans without algae or general life. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> About that, you know, and everybody doesn't think that the scum that they have, you know, in their... Aquariums is something that gives life, but mm -hmm. it does. And what's interesting is the amount of oxygen that allows us to be able to grow no, comes, from, comes from algae and aquatic life in general. Yes, correct. And basically it all started way back then. Way back then. And it's amazing that Japan to this day is one of the largest markets. It seems that they had that connection all the way back 10,000 years ago. Now we do see it coming up in other areas as well. We see it in Peru, and we see that they gathered kelp, which is which kind is of also like sort of yeah, algae. it's an aquatic yeah. plant life that is a, you know related to algae. It is algae, and what we see is probably we can you know surmise that they gathered it from the ocean, saw it coming mm -hmm. up on the beaches. Someone I guess had to try it. And they started using it in their food because we see from their refuse heaps uh, mm -hmm. that the, you can see the algae remnant that they must have used it maybe almost kind of like how the Japanese use it now as sushi, but maybe less civilized than that. Obviously, the first and uh, the most obvious way to use algae was uh, to eat it. Correct. Um, but um, were there any other usage that we might know of? Them? Uh, well, I mean, we do go far back enough uh, that weirdly enough, and some people agree and disagree with this, that you see uh, it in the Bible. Of course, everybody can know oh. what they want within I wonder where the... Okay, this is a very interesting connection, Bible and algae. So what is it about? Uh, so some people suggest in certain, you know, algae experts that are very interested in this kind of stuff suggest that maybe the manna that the Israelites mm -hmm. gathered in the desert was a sort of uh, combination of fungus and blue algae. And it'd be interesting to find out if any of the Bedouin cultures that live there now um, use this as a resource at all. Um, well, still, we, we talk about food, but my previous question was about any other ways of using algae because uh, I'm nowadays and we don't talk about this time but nowadays people use algae not only for food um, and um, I was just wondering if people uh, found any ways of using algae even in those times well if we go towards the European you know area the, the, the European continent Yep. and try to look at, you know, they have a better source of food than people mm -hmm. in, in the Sinai, you know, walking 
in the wilderness for 40 years. Uh, they have, we all know you cheese and wine and, and uh, olive oil for yeah. centuries. Uh, but we do know that the Romans did, and the Greeks, who were very um, intellectually created, uh, curious and always wanted to find out about more information, and that's where we also see the beginnings of science research. Mm-hmm. Uh, we see that they did, you know, they were curious enough to find and try to figure out what is this slime and what can we use it for. Uh, they didn't use it for food. What they did use it for is for feed for cattle sometimes when mm-hmm. there was a famine or during certain seasonal periods and you had to get your milk you know milk and cheese yeah, yeah. they used it as a as a feed for animals and you know, mixing it in they also used it as a manure and mm-hmm. mixed it in to the earth and used it as a biodegradable manure okay and yeah that- grow things so that since they had, uh, in my belief, since they had such a great resource of food, that they didn't see it as something that they needed to eat for, you know, nutrition. They already had nutrition coming from different areas. Instead, they used the algae as a resource, as a, as a thing to use as a manure or for feed of their cattle. Well, uh, yes, it's um, it's an interesting point, Dave. If if they saw this as uh, food at all because of the seemingly better quality of life, which wasn't always the case, by the way. But still, I kind of see uh, why Greeks and Romans specifically Correct. didn't want to use it as food because they always thought of themselves as some kind of yeah, know, better than yeah, the yeah, civilized people, the civilized people, yeah. which not the barbarians. Yes, which doesn't, you know, doesn't mean that Japanese uh, tribes in the Jamon period were were not civilized, (laughs) but still, um, kind of, to me, it makes sense with uh, Greeks and Romans. Um, And then probably their culture was based not on the, not mainly on the seafood as Japanese, right? So they didn't look at uh, everything that comes out of, of the sea as the source for food. Uh, but well, also seeing the difference would be that the the ancient Japanese or the Peruvians that lived in Pampa, um, that they were more of a hunter gatherer. They didn't have a sustained agricultural system like the future Romans and Greeks. True, had. true. Right. So it could be that, you know, it's just part of the gathering sort of you know point of view. And then we can also say that. We have, we have to remember that we're talking about archaeological evidence and uh, who knows, maybe um, there is some evidence uh, with, uh, you know, European uh, peoples as well. They used it at some point before they had agriculture. Um, but that's true. Well, talking about the food, we still even during, um, if we go back far enough, you know, not 10,000 years ago, but even... 800, 600 BCE, the Chinese, which were much more advanced, mm-hmm. were also using algae as, as a food product. So maybe it goes a little bit against the theory that, you know, the hunter-gatherer period versus Roman and Greek period is, you know, the Chinese who were well known to be very advanced even by 800 BCE and were already writing and, and had, you know, a language. Do we have any written evidence from China? We do have certain uh, evidence from China that is, um, since they had, you know, writing and they they wrote poetry, one of the, the, where we see it is in the book of poetry where they praise housewives that are cooking with algae. Oh, wow. This is, this is so beautiful right there. Um, But still... To write a poem about a housewife, this yeah. trivial thing as a housewife cooking King with algae, with algae, yeah. she should be praised. Yeah, and even in other places that we see, even in the Chinese culture, that they wrote uh, some algae are a delicacy uh, fit for the most honorable guest and even for the king himself. So they must have had a certain reverence, obviously, for algae and using it. Um, as a nutritional source. No, definitely. If, if, if 
if you say so, if you say that that was a delicacy even for the that's what they say yeah. <laughs> I, I personally agree with them uh, but you can also see that maybe uh, talking about European um, cultivation or gathering of algae and using it in certain ways versus let's say Asian mm-hmm. uh, um, you know in, in the Asian uh, area is more that uh, um, they have different tastes, you know. Yeah, so, absolutely. You know, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> and uh, to use algae is it does have a nice taste, a nice spinach taste. Uh, anybody that's eaten seaweed, that's the kind of taste that you get from from algae. Yeah. So let's speed up in our time machine a little bit and uh, uh, get to the beginning of the current era because everything we talked uh, just now was way back deep into the uh, BCE, the right? In the current era, what are the uh, evidence uh, of people uh, using well, algae during the current, we were, we we'll start to see in the common era, thanks to, we're coming back to the Romans again, uh, because of their curiosity and, you know, their philosophy and science, and science correct. We do have um, one of the first discoveries of Caroline algae, mm-hmm. which is what have uh, since the you know, cor- cor- I'm sorry coralline algae which is from the name you can understand that it has connection to coral reefs and it's the red stuff that grows on the outside it can be green also um, and this was figured out or found found out uh, by Pliny the elder who was a famous uh, naturalist uh, from the uh, first century and he you know, talks about many different things But one of the things that he figured out was, you know, the scientific purposes. So he actually discovered and uh, not only discovered, but described uh, not just algae, you know, in general, but he the gave it a name. relationship. In and the also, ocean. right. Yeah. So, so he made a research of understanding right. how he, to He's be. one of the people already. There was a word in Roman and Greek, um, the Roman... Uh, was uh, phukos, which is from Greek uh, phycos. Mm-hmm. And we have phycology that comes later on, much later on when we get which is? to the modern age. Phycology is the study of algae. Oh, right. So this is where it started in so the first already century. Already they were looking into it, but he starts to write it down and makes discoveries that show how algae is very important to the symbiotic relationship. Mm-hmm. Uh, between algae and life itself in the world. Amazing. Um, so here now I can see the Romans as, you know, as, as they were not only uh, using algae as something they, they don't think of. You know, we weren't high. Uh, yeah, weren't, but somebody, high yes, there was somebody who was interested in that. But they, yeah, they wanted <laughs> to know, you know, what, what, is, what is this stuff? Okay, so um, what will be our next stop in this uh, in our time journey? Machine, our yes, time, in our time journey to, through the time, right? Uh, well, we get to research comes later on that we found out about this in the 1960s, but we find a people in Africa in Chad, out of the Chad area, which is uh, you know different states, mm-hmm. more of a region, um, and we know them as the Can- Kanembu pe- people. Um, they're an ethnic group to the area near Lake Chad, hence the name of the, right. the country. Um, and we see that what they were doing, which was discovered later on in the 1960s, um, and, but they had been doing it already for centuries, uh, and their people or grouping or, or uh, civilization uh, comes around the 7th century CE uh-huh. of the Common Era. And what we see, what, what it was found, what they were doing, it was in Lake Chad, there's an algae or a cyanobacteria. Once again, algae has many groupings. Um, and it's called spirulina. Now, many people might know about spirulina. Yeah, I have, a, I have heard about it. Right. And it's, once again, this very... Um, can add a lot of flavor. It's very nutritional. Um, we even know that uh, spirulina has 15 times uh, the protein of soybeans. 
35 times the corn and 70 times the uh, protein of wheat even. So even for a small plant, it's giving a lot of nutritional value mm -hmm. out, which we can imagine people that are in Chad, which is the sub-Saharan area, um, are looking for any nutritional source. And when they find this algae growing in the lakes, what they do is they use cloth and put it into the water and grab out the algae. They take as after they've harvested that, they put them in sort of bowls that they mm -hmm. dig out in the sand next to the lake. They put it in there and then since there's a lot of sun, they, they, let dry, it, it out. they dry it out into cakes. And then they sell it in markets and that's where we find it later on um, being sold. So this is also a very distinctive moment here in our conversation because previously we, except for Romans, uh, we talked about people gathering algae, just taking it from nature and using it somehow. Uh, and here we see that Kanimbu people have the way of cultivate, cultivating mainly. Or yeah, they put together they, a yes, system. Yes, they figured out the system how to gather it, and... There must have been certain right. prices for it, and etc. So this is also an advanced uh, technique of sorts, Correct. which is also amazing. Um, well, ta talking about them, um, it's it's not even the just the cultivation and the system of doing it and selling it in the market. It's also using it as a sort of herb for different recipes. Mm -hmm. And they have a main thing that uh, um, it's a French word, but that's the first people that started discovering these people. Um, and they call it uh, Dichi which is, um, those are the cakes yeah. that they dried out. And what they would do with these DG, these cakes, is they would crumble them and put them in with tomato and pepper and sort of make a sauce out of it uh, and put that over fish or beans or, or meat. Sounds, uh, sounds really yummy. Yeah, I, I haven't tried it myself, but... Uh, I wonder if there are any uh, places to try that. Well, I mean, in your local supermarket, if you go to Whole Foods or your health, your local health uh, store, there probably is a spirulina that's been put into pasta or used in different ways, oh, sort right. of like these people well, use it as well. Okay. I have seen only uh, dried spirulina that you add to water. Right. Which is the same. The, the same. It's thing. literally the same thing that they created. Um, you know, right. Look at that. It started. Um, what was the century again? The, the, the seventh century. Seventh century of current era. Amazing. So what was interesting about that, we talk about how Chad is now creating this um, system of growing it and cultivating it. Right. And what's interesting is that spirulina is is one of the first uh, algae to start to be used, you know, not seaweed, start to be gathering out of the lakes. But what's actually very interesting, and if we can get back in our algae time machine... Yep, let's go. Um, what's interesting is that they used spirulina, and then we have an, another, across the waters, across the Atlantic, we have another group also using spirulina. And that would be the Aztecs in Meso Mesoamerica, period. All right. Between the 13th okay. and 15th century CE. Now I'm if we can move forward in that direction. And where we get this evidence from is from the Spaniards discovering America mm -hmm. uh, and conquering the Aztecs, for lack of a better word. Hence, they're called the con con Conquistadors. Right. And what's interesting is because they, the Conquistadors came over, they are writing down um, kind of like the Romans and the Greeks. Yeah, they're documenting. They're documenting they did, everything right. that's going on. So what's interesting is one of the documents and one of the diaries of a certain uh, conquistador called Diaz de Castillo. Mm -hmm. He writes about how algae is being cultivated by the Aztecs. Now, they're doing it very similarly to the Canembo people in Chad, and they're gathering it out of a lake called Texcoco. Okay. And if anybody knows about Aztec 
uh, history, it's written about happening uh, and being sold in markets mm -hmm. um, in Tenochtitlan, which is the capital of Aztec. Of, okay. Of Aztec. Oh, yeah. Okay. I got it. And they're being sold in the market um, and they're being used in almost the same way as the Kanembu people used it, as an herb, as something that uh, you can use to thicken a soup and to create a sauce. And they're doing it in sort of the same way. They're gathering it out of the lake. They're making it into like almost brick shapes. Okay. Like cakes. Cakes. And they're drying it out in the sun. Just like the Kanembu people. So sun and drying out algae has you know, been used for a long period of time uh, to bake these cakes that are sold in the markets. Well, but what I understand now is we, we use this word cake, but it's not that there is a recipe, you know, like using flour and, and eggs and just adding algae or instead of flour or something. So it's basically drying out. Those it's dried out algae. Dried yeah. out algae. Like and then dried out it looks seaweed. like a, yeah. a piece of uh, cake. Like, like a cake. A brick, yeah. Yeah. Has the consistency. So you can't, eat it. You can't eat it without adding to something else. That's what well, I mean. Well, you could, but I don't, I wouldn't suggest it. But that would be dry. That would be like... Uh, It'd be like eating dried seaweed, which is a delicacy, but... Uh, okay. Some people like it, but that's sort of the concept. You can eat it, but they used it more as to add into recipes for flavor. Uh, originally, the conquistador that came over uh, described it in his diary as it having the consistency of cheese... Mm. Um, he says it was like cheese, which it doesn't, I don't know if he tasted it or not. Um, it doesn't really have the taste of cheese as we've been talking about seaweed. It has more of like a spinach, uh, taste to it, like kelp or seaweed. Yeah. And what's, what, what is interesting is that they almost did the same kind of recipe. Once again, it's almost like these two people, one in Chad and one in, uh, Mesoamerica, kind of had a correspondence where they were reading each other's blogs. I, I don't know, but they used the <laughs> recipe in the same way and added it with uh, tomatoes and uh, um, with tomatoes and, and chili. Mm. Peppers. Yeah. So one was using what they had peppers and one yeah, was right. using chilies, which is right. you know, peppers also. So, um, was he just describing or is there any uh, evidence that he uh, I don't know, bought it or the garden as a president? Pre well, I don't think the conquistadors had to buy anything sometimes. Sometimes they would just take it. Also true. And um, a lot of the algae, that the, the spirulina that was grown in this area and all these different lakes, um, because of cultivation and they sort of dried out the lakes... Uh, the Aztecs have been kind of taking care of lakes. They yep. lived kind of on lakes. Um, they, because the, the conquistadors didn't care for algae as we were, you know, um, they didn't care about it. And it, it went away in the last place that we have now evidence of still spirulina growing in a lake in the Aztec area is in Lake uh, Texcoco. Is it still? It's still there. It's still there. You can go there and harvest it just like they did back. Uh, no, but do people do that? Is there any kind of? Uh... There's no evidence since you know, you know, Mexican culture doesn't uh, really use algae. It's not known for using spirulina. It seems like the it's recipe bit, uh, sort of disappeared. Yeah, it's a bit disappointing. Um, it's also I can I can say that. As uh, we talked about Japanese people and Chinese, and it was so long ago, but still nowadays, and uh, we're getting closer to this. Nowadays, we're kind of still discovering algae. Um, and um, both of us being uh, from uh, European, Western you know, civilization, it makes me think about what... What are the reasons for it? And I can't help but think that in Europe, especially after 
uh, we talked about Roman Empire, right? That they they did amazing uh, job with you know developing arithmetics and lots of sciences Science. that after that were forgotten Correct. because of the dark ages of this period of middle ages right, right? as we the, the middle ages is called the dark ages which is interesting it's the dark ages of science in general of, of exactly body. this is Everything the reason why they, why they are sometimes called, called like that dark, yeah. and um, anything from this period i assume that conquistadors didn't didn't take algae back to yeah. europe no, it seems like they just watched these, you know, the Aztecs doing this. Um, but uh, yeah, they, but when they had it written down. They saw it happening, but it they didn't resonate with them to keep on using it in Europe. For instance, like coffee that they they found and potatoes. Right, right. They took those. They didn't back bring it. Happened. But still, um, but still, algae made their way into uh, into Europe. And uh, I wonder when that happened. If there is any information, if we specifically can say that, you know, from this ne- from this time on, we consistently see algae being mentioned in the uh, European. Uh, well, we only context. get to that kind of, you know, kind of, uh, part of the conquistadors and the discovery of America and and what we start to call in the 15th century or you know 16th century. We call it the Enlightenment period. Right. So going into the Enlightenment period, uh, we we see it a lot more. We see science being rediscovered after the Dark Ages. And we're, we're able to see all these scientists are now doing the same kind of research that the Romans and Pliny the Elder and others had been doing centuries before. Now it's even more advanced with the discovery of the microscope and the printing press being able to spread information around. right and right so th- that was the tool to help people uh, biologists to take a closer look yeah so we see that the microscope helps illuminate now the future discovery of algae to our modern age and now we're starting to use algae not only for as a recipe or for a food product but using it kind of like the Romans did mm. as a material a resource uh, for manure or feed for cattle or nutrition supplement for human beings or also it could be used as a dye. Uh, you know, right. these different ways of figuring out how to use algae. Uh, there is a dark period, as we talked about during the Middle Ages, but after the Enlightenment period, as we all know, Science start to right. started exactly. to be uh, rebirthed, and we get to our modern age of how we're using algae now. So I guess this will make it for the first episode. I think we need to we l- can leave our algae time machine for a while. To, we can to relax. Us, it needs to yes, yes. It needs be it retooled. Needs to re- you recharge know, recharge it, yeah. its batteries. And next time we'll. Go back to um, the Middle Ages, or should I say the modern era? Correct. And we'll talk in more detail about the research people were doing about algae and how it led up to the uh, psychology and the algae growing industry that we have. Now and love today. Now today. We say goodbye to you. Keep algae listening and we'll keep algae talking. If you would like to learn more, Please subscribe and follow Algatalk on Facebook and YouTube. And if you have any questions or feedback, email algatalkpodcast at gmail.com. Keep blooming, Algabuds.